Avengers. Infinite Wars Chapter 6. Underlying Malevolence. Chancellor Palpatine stood at the large curving windows of his personal office, looking out at the busy skyline of the planet of Coruscant. Not a day goes by where the skies remain cluttered and busy with commuters, civilians, workers, and so on going about their day and night. It was quite a sight really. A sinister smile made its way onto the Chancellor's face, counting down the days where at long last the Republic would fall. In its place, the Sith Empire that had been hiding in the shadows for a millennia, will rise once again and rule the galaxy. And yet, a great shockwave within the Force signaled the start of something different. Something that will change the very way the galaxy works. He could feel it. Every Force sensitive could feel. Chancellor Palpatine, Captain Steve Rogers is here to speak with you as requested. And it all starts with this man. Thank you. Palpatine put up his generally pleasant facade. Please send him in. The entrance to the Chancellor's office opened, revealing the star-spangled leader of the Avengers walk in with his trademark shield on his back. Chancellor Palpatine. Steve Rogers said respectfully. You wanted to see me? Yes, yes, please my good sir. Palpatine said kindly, gesturing to the chairs in front of his desk. Please have a seat captain, no need to stand there uncomfortably. Obliging to the Chancellor's request, Steve placed his shield on the side of his chair, while sitting down before the Chancellor who took his own seat. I hope your time here in Coruscant has been pleasant. Palpatine said, making small talk. The Temple and the Jedi have been very accommodating. Steve said with a nod. As they should be. Palpatine said expectantly. What you and your team has done in such a short amount of time is truly to be commended. We didn't do as much as many would expect. Steve stated plainly. Two planets in an overall galactic war seems minimal at best, sir. As humble as you may state your actions to be, the defense of Naboo as well as notifying the Republic of an impending invasion of the clone's homeworld of Kamino, are no small matters, Captain Rogers. Palpatine said, crossing his fingers together. You may look at it as small actions of grander war, but many would find themselves inclined to disagree. Especially the people of my home of Naboo. I've even heard rumblings within the clone army of the actions of your recent reunion with the one called Colonel Rhodes, who was instrumental in notifying the Republic of the Separatists' plans of invasion. If I were to be honest with you, Chancellor, everything you listed off was happenstance and eat-jerk reactions. Steve admitted. I along with Sam and Scott, did not wish to see the loss of innocent lives. Rhodey himself said that siding with the clone troopers on the moon called Rishi, was the only viable means of reuniting with us. My, oh my. Palpatine chuckled good-naturedly. I have met a rare few who displayed an exceptional level humility save the GD order, but you truly are a man unto yourself. I try, Chancellor. Steve said with a small humored smirk, though it had yet to reach his eyes. This went unnoticed at the moment by the secret Dark Lord of the Sith. Doesn't seem like you try at all. Palpatine went on before furrowing his brows. Still I feel underwhelmed right now. Sir? You have done a great deal for the Republic and yet, the Jedi Order and Republic have yet to truly reward you with something greater than some meager living quarters for your stay here. Palpatine said with a shake of his head. Chancellor Palpatine, we don't mean to impose. Palpatine only cut him off. I will hear none of it, Captain Rogers. I cannot, in good consciousness, leave you and your allies with nothing more than a room to reside in. No, this will not do. On this, I impose my will of assisting you and your allies in finding the rest of your lost comrades. Whatever you ask of me, I shall do so within a heartbeat. Steve couldn't help but widen his eyes in slight disbelief at the offer of a chancellor for him and his friends. This kind of deal coming from the head of a centralized galactic government was too good to be true. And therein was the silver lining. It was too good to be true. Say what you will about politics, people, how living sentient beings, one thing remained the same. Governments of any shapes and sizes are run with agendas in mind that can be changed and twisted in time. And from what he had been reading about the galactic history of this galaxy, it may prove to be true to a much greater degree than his own revelations back home on Earth. The Chancellor appeared to be a kind and benevolent man, though with a strength to him and a charisma to match. And yet, there was something familiar to this display. This act. He had seen it before and too many times in a short amount of it, since the years of him waking up in a new world he did not recognize. But there was still the prospect of using Palpatine's offer to a degree. Steve can't deny that they are by all technicalities stuck here. So using anything he could at his disposal in order to find the other Avengers and get back home to Earth. 
Then there was the Galactic War they had already inadvertently participated in on the side of the Galactic Republic. Twice now and with how news spread like wildfire in any forms of news media, their actions had already been broadcasted across the galaxy, no doubt earning a bit of the ire of the Separatist faction. If he were to be honest with himself, after learning a great deal about this whole war, he did not exactly view the cis in a positive light. That's not to say that the Republic was at fault with the way they've conducted themselves. He should thank Nat when he finds her in teaching him how to be extremely thorough when researching two sides to an argument. Both sides were at great fault as one instigated war, while the other quite literally did nothing until they had no choice but to fight in the war. Steve couldn't help the biting remark that came out his mouth upon reading that portion of recent galactic history. There was a disagreement back on a farm he recalled at the time, but he decided not to dwell on it. Returning to the current moment at hand, Steve stood from his seat and gave the Chancellor a hard but respectful stare. I'll consider this offer very seriously, Chancellor. Steve said truthfully. I will speak with my comrades on this regard. We're not gonna dismiss it so lightly. Take all the time you need, Captain Rogers. Palpatine said understandingly though with a joking tone added. But please do hurry, there's a war still going on after all. Right? Steve frowned, eyes glancing down. The war. Palpatine observed the superhero's reaction momentarily. What do you make of this war, if I may ask, Captain Rogers? Palpatine found himself asking. A man of your rank and clear talent must have his own opinion of war. Steve regarded the aged man momentarily, silently contemplating the question. His eyes drifted over his shoulder at the sight of several lot gunships whizzing by with their hatch doors open to reveal squadrons of clones from various corps and legions. There's a lot one could say about this war. Steve said slowly. Moreover the necessary means and actions that could have been done to prevent such a galactic scale conflict. Something the Republic and the GD work strenuously in doing so. And yet, it still happened as it would have. Steve said with a stoic visage. Pardon? Palpatine was confused by such a rebuttal. I'm sorry. Steve waved off, rubbing his chin in thought. Just a stray thought from the past. Of course. Palpatine said in a pardoning manner. Though, you are correct in a way. As much as the Republic tried, and tried it did, the war and all of this madness truly felt inevitable. All that could be done is put off the inevitable when I look back on all of our actions. War is a universal concept that is always inevitable. Steve said with a sense of aged wisdom in his words. It's one of the many things that are doomed to repeat itself throughout history. I never took you for a philosophical and scholarly individual, Captain Rogers. Palpatine joked with a friendly chortle. The good soldier is only as effective as his mind is than his sword. Steve said a faux sage-like tone. Oh? And who said that? Someone back on my planet said something similar to that. Steve explained. I think at least. Might have missed that lesson back at boot camp. Palpatine chuckled lightly, leaning back into his chair to get more comfortable. You are truly a marvel, Captain Rogers, if you don't mind me saying. The Chancellor said light-heartedly. From what I've seen your companions pull off to your own feats on Naboo and your most recent friend, Colonel Rhodes. And you say that there are still others like you somewhere perhaps in this galaxy. Yeah, five others. Steve said, longingly thinking about his lost friends. I do hope they're doing well enough for themselves. They can take care of themselves. Steve said, confident in his teammates. All of them can adapt to their situations and do what they need to do in order to survive. Such confidence. Palpatine said, showing a sense of awe. False awe. I wish I held the belief you had in the people you trust, Captain Rogers. I have only a small handful. Got a trust in the friends you do have. Steve said. At the end of the day, they're all you have sometimes. Palpatine only shook his head, calm smile in place. You hold greater wisdom than even I can fathom, Captain. And I thought I have my fair share of knowledge. Steve only smiled once more, yet it still didn't reach his eyes. He couldn't help but feel a growing level of discomfort around him. Maybe it was the air, maybe just homesickness, but something was really starting to bug him about being here, and it felt all too familiar in his mind. Sighing, Steve stood from his seat. I gotta head back to the temple. Don't wanna leave my friends for too long. Of course, Captain Rogers. Palpatine said understandingly, standing up out of his seat as well and offered his hand. Just remember, my offer to assist you and your comrades still stands even if you deny it the first time around.
Steve only nodded his head in turn a show of respect and goodbye, shaking the man's hand before grabbing his shield and placing it on his back whilst exiting the office. As soon as he departed, Palpatine's facial expression morphed into one of a scowling frown while seating himself again. For some reason, things did not go as expected. He could feel it. This Captain Rogers was not one to be so easily swayed as he first expected. It seems that there is more to this man than he least expected. Sure he appeared to be a kind of run-of-the-mill soldier, yet the force and the man's own presence spoke a very different tone in front of Sidious. He was a man not easily fooled, he could admit that much. But it mattered not. For Sidious, it wouldn't be long until he would either sway the support of the Avengers to his side, or simply remove them entirely from the field. Both of these could be accomplished in time. And yet, Sidious felt his nose and eye twitch in unison momentarily, a sense of irritation washing over him. Teeth clenched, the Sith Lord willed himself to calm down and retain a calm demeanor. Why was so much bothering him right now? What in the name of the Force was happening? He had never felt such a suffocating feeling of frustration before. Was it truly because of the arrival of these Avengers? Then that means he'd have to proceed with a cautious quickening of his plans. The Force wills it. However, Palpatine's seat slowly swiveled around to face the window, eyes set on one structure specifically. The Jedi Temple, seat to the Sith's ancient age-old enemy lay there before him. A temple that in good time will fall under the control of the Sith, once again as it did so many centuries ago. Though he couldn't see him, Palpatine could feel him. Stretching his connection and feeling in the Force, through some difficulty, Sidious, located the Jedi Grandmaster Yoda. The little green imp was sitting within a personal meditation chamber with force surrounding the Jedi as it did him. In fact, the whole force has been on the fritz and high alert since the initial shockwave, and it didn't seem to be calming down anytime soon. The more Sidious thought on the matter, the more the underlying anxiety seemed to grow. What does this mean? What could it cause? He knew that something like this was not so easily ignored, and since it has yet to calm down so to speak, this in turn could lead to unforeseen consequences. Sidious needed to start looking into contingencies sooner than later, it appears. Meanwhile, at the Jedi Temple was the aforementioned Grandmaster Yoda, who was levitating above his seat in a deep trance, as he allowed the Force to entirely encompass his very being. The door opened and Yoda exhaled, slowly lowering himself down. Master Windu, Yoda said expectantly. Troubled you are, I sense. Was it that easy to tell? Mace dryly asked, seating himself in front of the Grandmaster. Easy for all to tell. Yoda said in light humor. All are troubled, no need to fret Master Windu. Alone in this case, you are not. Mace Windu let out a tired sigh, crossing his legs yet slumped forward. What is happening, Grandmaster? Windu inquired intently. Throughout the temple and the galaxy, the GD and perhaps other Force sensitives, they've all been on edge and hyper aware of everything. It's a typhoon in the Force. Spoken to Fisto, you have. He's always had a strange way with words. Yoda only hummed, opening his eyes since Windu entered the chamber and faced his fellow master. Much on your mind, you have, Master Windu. As do I. Yoda said, face in deep concentration. The force a constant state of flux it has been. Since the arrival of these Avengers. Windu stated knowingly. Blame them, do you? Not necessarily blame them. Windu said, furrowing his brows in thought. More like set something in motion that we have yet to understand. Hmm. A vision you have seen. Perhaps, premonition. Maybe. Windu only nodded to himself. But the force, the way it's been acting so to speak. It's not like the dark side or even the light. Just the force, you feel. Yoda nodded knowingly. In a state of flux, the force is. A greater change to come, there is. Worry not Master Windu. All is, as the force wills it. But these four men and even the other five missing, are not like anything we've seen in the galaxy. Windu said, rubbing his chin. They are devoid of the Force, nothing within them whatsoever. How can they be a part of the Force's will? Unclear of that, I am. Yoda admitted. Accidental they say their arrival was. Perhaps it was indeed such an event. Nothing to do with the Force, perhaps they did. Though the Force knows the magnitude to which they bring. So what does that mean for us? Windu questioned. What does it mean for the Jedi? The Republic? Maybe even the whole galaxy? Yoda only closed his eyes, reaching out to the Force once more, and feeling the rapid state of perpetual vibrancy, it continued to give off. Whether or not a connection to the Force they have, responding to them it is. Yoda confirmed. We must watch these Avengers. 
What they do, the force in turn responds. And if it could be something negative. Windu asked with a hard stare. Do what we must, as will the force. Yoda could only say. During all this, Steve Rogers had exited the Republic's executive building and was face to face with the bustling world city metropolis. Letting out an exhausted breath, Steve's enhanced eyes could barely keep up with all the darting skyways above. Vehicles flying left, right, up, down in all manner of directions to get to their destinations. And he thought waking up in the 21st century was jarring. Looking around, Steve suddenly felt overwhelmed as he realized that he was not next to the docking bays of the executive building. Great. Steve muttered to himself. He felt extremely out of place right now, more so than ever before. What have you gotten yourself into Rogers? Steve said, trying to figure out where to go. It appeared that the Coruscant guard that had assisted in bringing him here, must have either left him here or forgotten about him entirely. Not that the latter was impossible considering how hectic everything seemed to be on this planet. At least from Cap's point of view. He was about to approach a random passerby when... Captain Rogers. Whirling around he saw two distinctly familiar faces. Senators Amidala. Steve said respectfully. And your Senator Chai. Chuchi. The blue-skinned alien corrected politely. Right. Steve said. Are you alright, Captain? Pad masked. You seem a bit... Loss. Chuchi guessed getting a sheepish look out of Cap. More or less. Steve admitted with no shame. I need to get back to the docking bay and get back to the GD temple. Oh, well we could give you a ride if you would like. Chuchi offered. I wouldn't want to impose. Steve said when Padden cut him off. Nonsense. Amidala waved for him to follow with a friendly smile. Please, this is nothing in comparison for what you did for me and the people of Nabu. You did help in saving us after all. Chuchi cheerfully reminded. The people of my planet have seen what you have done, and you saved my sister and niece. Padden reminded with a praising smile. I owe you a debt of gratitude I can never truly repay. Steve blinked before smirking slightly in amusement. Well you would be the second person today that would say that to me. Padm and Chuchi tilted their heads at that statement. The second? Padm said. Who was the first? Chancellor Palpatine. Steve answered. He called me in earlier to his office to have a small conversation. Now both senators were curious. What was it about? Chuchi asked while the three of them began walking towards the docking bay, pad and gesturing them to do so. Just a few things here and there. Steve idly said. He said he wanted to thank me personally and all about what Scott, Sam and I did on Nabu. Well that makes sense. Chuchi mused. You were after responsible in playing a large part in repelling the separatist invasion. He said the same thing. Steve said, eyes furrowed in thought. Pad noticed his expression. What's wrong, Captain? Steve's lip twitched upwards slightly. Please, Senators. There's no need to call me Captain all the time. You could just call me Steve Rogers. Ah, then I insist on you simply calling me Pad. And that's Chuchi for you and your comrades. Appreciated, ladies. Steve tipped his head forward. And as for what's wrong it isn't what's wrong per se, it's what he offered me and my allies for the duration of our time here. What is it? Chuchi asked. He offered us the chance to use whatever resources he can give in finding our allies that may be scattered across the galaxy. Steve said. Both ladies' eyes white into Palpatine's apparent offer. That's quite the proposition. Pat remarked. It seems a bit much to be honest. Steve stated. My team and I only helped out twice in total in comparison to the Galactic Wide War where many had already been fighting in for months now. Feels a little too familiar honestly. What do you mean? Chuchi inquired. I'll tell you ladies about it some other time. Steve said kind-heartedly. Well Pat and hummed in thought. I have thought about what you and your allies had done for me in my home. I can't ever thank you enough truthfully. Say what you will to make yourself modest, Steve, but your actions will be remembered far more at times than your words. Chuchi said cheerfully. You have a friend in me. And me as well. Padm said with a kind smile. So I also extend the offer of aid. I don't know what I'm able to offer, but if I can help in any way, I can do my part. Chuchi added. Ladies, I really appreciate the offer, I do. Steve said earnestly. But I would feel like I would be taking advantage of a something with you guys, and I'd rather not do such a thing. Humble and modest. Padm said with approval. You sound like a GD. I wouldn't know much about that. Steve said with a shrug. Padm only smirked at him. Well, I'll keep my offer open then. 
A favor or two, how about that then? That seems like a fair compromise. Chuchi said, jokingly professional. Steve opened his mouth to respond until he momentarily contemplated the help she had extended towards him and his friends. Senator Amidala did not have the same overbearing vibe that the Chancellor had. There was no ulterior motive in her eyes or gestures, displaying a show genuine character and want to assist and help others. The young Ryochuchi seemed to share these actions, hoping to emulate her older colleague. Thank you. Steve said humbly. This means a lot to me and my friends will appreciate it as well. Scene cut. Steve had been dropped off by the temple thanks to Senators Amidala and Chuchi, and headed to the guest rooms of the temple. He passed by some GD here and there, getting more and more familiar with the area he resided, as it did not take him that long in finding his room. As he approached the corridor with the Avengers room lined up side by side, he heard the telltale signs of machines whirring, wielding with accompanying laughter and conversation. Quirking a brow, Steve moved past his room and towards a room up ahead where the source of all the noise was coming from. Entering the room, he found Sam, Scott and Rhodey all in new clothing, their suits splayed about in front of them with a few GD younglings. Some were in their early teens, while the rest were all still kids. And amongst them was also the head librarian of the GD archives, Jocasta New. She was conversing with Scott in a very patient and amused manner, as he seemed to rambling every now and then, whilst she pointed out various tools for him to use, explaining how to use each one. Sam had his own set of tools, yet these were ones from the Avengers base back on Earth in upstate New York, same as Rhodey. The former aviator noticed Steve entering the room. Hey Cap. All attention turned towards him, with many of the younglings looking up at Cap and Hey guys. Steve greeted, looking around the room. I see you guys are keeping yourselves busy. Might as well do something. Rhodey remarked, tapping on his helmet. Figured it would be a good time to fix up my suit. Where do you get all these tools? Steve asked, picking up one of them that was currently unused. These are all from Earth. You could thank Scott for that. Rhodey said, head nodding over to Lang who was fiddling with his optics on his helmet. Scott heard Rhodey's statement, glancing up to see Cap facing him. Hope and I have been working on a few new advancements with Hank. Scott elaborated. The suits we already had come with the basic tools needed in repairing our suits and equipment to keep it functioning. Sliding an optic in place over its eye hole with a satisfied nod, Scott went on. So we've made a few upgrades here and there to carry more on us and a few for the rest of the team as well. Scott said, resting his helmet on his lap whilst resting his arm on it. I got a lot of tools with me in my belt but not everything. Really, I only have half of our stuff. What we could carry at least. Who has the other half? Hope. Yup. Scott confirmed with an discomforted expression. Hope they're all okay. We'll find them. Steve promised until he felt a tug on his leg, and he looked down to see a young GD youngling looking up at him curiously. He had almost forgotten they were all surrounded by these youngsters. This GD youngling was Togerton Boy, if memory served him correctly in regards to the near thousands of different species that populated the galaxy. He had a brownish-orange tint to his skin with grey leku horn and green horizontal stripes. Hey there. Steve greeted kindly. What can I do for you little guy? The kid's face scrunched up in focus, trying to figure out the right words to say. Ah, is it true that you guys are heroes on your world? The little GD asked. This in turn made Steve blink, while a few of the other children looked over to the super soldier. And where did you hear that? Steve asked, a glint of amusement in his eyes. Wordlessly, the little GD turned and pointed to Scott who was polishing his helmet a bit too intensely. Steve only gave the ex-convict a dry look of clear amusement. Really Scott? You do realize you're part of the team, right? Steve stated. For two months now. Ah, don't mind him. Sam waved off. Tic Tac is still a man-child at heart. Man-child. Several of the GD younglings repeated in confusion. What's that? That's when a dude as old as Scotty here still acts like he's 12. Rhodey quip making said man slump his head with a groan. You guys suck sometimes, you know that. Scott said dejectedly. So are you guys all heroes then? Another youngling asked, this one being a young Twi'lek. In a manner of speaking. Steve said with an air of mystery to him, making some of the kids look up at him excitedly. Really? The Togerton kid asked. Oh yeah. Sam said brashly, making Steve deadpan at his friend. See where we come from, we're called Earth's mightiest heroes. We take the hero life very seriously. How? A little GD girl asked now. By helping anyone and everyone in any way we can. Rhodey explained. 
And if we can't do it, don't worry. Scott said with a dramatic flare. Because there are other heroes out there that can and will. The kids looked at one another with awe and excitement. Can we be heroes like you? Another Twi'lek youngling asked, this one being a girl. Well from what we've heard, the GD are called the protectors of the galaxy. Scott said with a sly wink, patting the young girl's head. Which means it's not a matter of if but when you kids become heroes in your own right. The little girl only smiled bashfully, blushing a bit at the compliment. The rest of the kids chattered about animatedly until Jocasta spoke up, stating that it was time for them to get something to eat. They couldn't hide the groan of disappointment, but nonetheless acquiesced upon seeing Jocasta's stern gaze. Jocasta began shepherding the children out, while giving the Avengers an appreciative thank you for entertaining the younglings. As they were at long last left alone, the three Avengers who were here before Steve's return, resumed their work upon their equipment. So Cap, it was Sam who spoke first. How'd your meeting with the Chancellor go? Steve frowned, crossing his arms as he recalled the entirety of his exchange with the elderly individual. It was more of a serenade session if you could call it that. Steve said. What? So your typical, Cap is awesome meeting. Sam said in humor. Did you get a medal for your troubles? Not necessarily. Steve answered with a disgruntled expression. The Chancellor offered up to help us while we're here. Really? Scott looked up from his work. What kind of help? The blank check kind. Steve said knowingly towards the other two military men within the room. Yeah but uh, Cap. Rody raised his hand with an inquisitive brow raised. The way you phrased it didn't make it seem like a good thing. What's up, Cap? Sam inquired. Chancellor giving you some weird vibe or something like that. Like this whole force stuff. Scott asked aloud, garnering looks from the trio making him shrug. Heard all that mystic talk from the kids and the other GD. Steve smirked slightly at Scott's comment, finding some merit to it. But he knew better. No, not exactly the force so to speak. Steve murmured. Just something a bit too familiar for our tastes. He finished that last statement by making eye contact with Sam, conveying a silent message of you know what I'm talking about. Sam's eyes narrowed and nodded in understanding. Rody let out a tired sigh. Alright then, so now what do we do? He wasn't only one though. Steve said, eyes down now. Senators Amidala and Chuchi also offered to help us out. That didn't sound as bad. Rody said. No, they aren't. Steve mused. So then what do we do Cap? Rody asked the question on everyone's mind. Steve was silent, trying hard to figure out their next step in this galaxy. His friends had already taken some initiative of their own in learning about the galaxy, as well as how some of the technology here works. Case in point, Scott Lang had a few new gadgets and gizmos that were clearly not of Earth. There was also the topic of the war going on right now, and how it is clearly a galactic threat to every and all denizens in the galaxy. Even planets that are Republic strongholds like Naboo, prove to be reachable within the confines of this conflict. Innocent civilians across the cosmos are under the constant threat of imminent war, knocking at their doorsteps. Though he did not know them fully, the GD seemed to be one of the few willingly going out into the stars and stand guard for those who cannot fight for themselves as detached these protectors seem to be. His thoughts ended at the sounds of light footsteps being accompanied by a wooden object tapping upon the floors in the corridors of the temple. And walked Grandmaster Yoda all by himself. Found you at an opportune time I did. Yoda said in greeting. All four of the Avengers gathered here they are. Master Yoda. Steve said in respect. What can we do for you? The question many have asked today. Yoda stated, hand raised as he used the force to move some chairs over for himself and Rogers. Come, sit. Much to talk I feel we do. Obliging the elderly master, Steve sat before Yoda, while the implied GD master gauged the leader of the Avengers with a critical eye. Yoda grunted a moment later, closing his eyes. Grandmaster. Steve said in slight concern. Apologies, Captain Rogers. Yoda said, waving his hand down in calming manner. Much on my mind there is, a sentiment I feel you share. Was I that easy to read? Steve asked in good humor. Quite. Yoda said with a knowing smile. Though understandable, your mince it is. Not your world, galaxy, nor your conflict this is. Steve nodded, eyes becoming distant at the thought of the clone wars raging on out there. Change is coming. Yoda announced. Your arrival into the galaxy, truly unexpected it is. The Force warned nothing of your coming. What is the Force you guys keep talking about? Scott abruptly asked aloud. It's all we hear in this temple. Can't fault Tic Tac for asking. Sam agreed with the ex-con. 
This horse thing sounds like some kind of religion or whatever. You mentioned something about it not telling you about our rival. Steve noted. What does it even mean? Does the force speak to you? Yoda blinked, an oddly fond expression finding its way onto his face. The force. Yoda spoke in his sage-like manner. That which binds all that live in breath. The force is that which gives all GD the powers we all share. It binds us, guides us and enables us the ability to carry out its will. That sounds like a broad statement really. Rhodey couldn't help but point out. How do you know what this force wants? Unclear and mistaken we can be. Yoda admitted, giving each Avenger a hard look. The force, a mystery that all Jedi have long pursued in learning and teaching. Countless millennia, we have lived to serve and understand. Yoda recited, something he has done to many Padawans within the temple. A Jedi does not use the force for personal gain. Only for defense and knowledge is our way. But even then at times, even we fail. The war? Steve said, already knowing the answer with a confirming nod from the GD master. Prevented, we could not. Yoda admitted, getting a strange look from Steve. Many lives lost in the conflict. The force, shrouded in darkness it has become. Much fear, permeating the galaxy. I don't think even the force can prevent something like that. Sam said with a dry deadpan. War is a universal language. Steve said somberly. The more people do in trying to prevent such a thing, the more inevitable it becomes. Yoda stared at the super soldier with a tired but hearty gaze. Wisdom suits you well, Captain Rogers. Yoda prays. Much wisdom you have to share, I feel you have. I don't think it measures up much to the 800 years you have from what we've heard, Master Yoda. Steve said good-naturedly. Yoda chuckled at that remark, a warm smile on his aged face. At times, the old needs to learn from the young it does. Come the end of the war, those that survive must show the galaxy a better path. That's all some could really hope for. Steve said. Your intentions. Yoda said, now more serious. What is it you wish to do? The Avengers exchanged glances with one another, unsure of how to answer exactly. The only thing they could really agree on is. We need to find the rest of the team. Steve firmly stated. They're out there somewhere, lost in the galaxy with no real idea as to where we all are. We honestly got lucky with finding each other so quickly. Sam said, gesturing to the current team. But the others might not be so. What to do then? Yoda asked again. Well Steve momentarily contemplated on whether or not he should say this but, before I came back to the temple, I was brought before the Chancellor of the Republic. This got a sharp look from Yoda as he was unaware of such a thing transpiring. Go on. Steve complied as he told the Grand Master what went on in Palpatine's office. As he did, the ancient GD hummed in thought. Processing what was conversed. And what do you make of this, Captain Rogers? Yoda inquired. Conflict I sense in you. Even if this sounds too good to be true with us getting untold resources and finding the rest of our friends, there's something quite off about this whole deal he's giving us. You can say experience has enlightened me in such things. Sam snorted at the jibe, shaking his head at their past adventures back on Earth. Oh if you think that's bad, let me tell you how most of my past jobs went before I even remotely joined you guys. Scott jokingly said, hoping to lighten up the mood a little. I've got quite the load. No doubt, tic tac. Yoda rubbed his chin in thought, slightly disturbed at what the Chancellor was doing behind the backs of the GD. The Avengers are guests of the temple, and yet here the Chancellor is, swooping in and seemingly courting the Avengers over to his side. Now that he really thought about it, this felt a bit too familiar to this scenario. Palpatine has done something like this before, in fact he's even doing it right now. But the brash, headstrong GD Knight seemingly called the Chosen One. The response, this offer you have? Yoda asked. Steve scratched the back of his head, mulling over the offer from Palpatine. I kinda said I'll think about it. Though not really sure about it. Really feels like I'm just gonna reject him straight out. This garnered a surprise priorities from Yoda. Wise, you sure? I don't trust him. Steve blatantly stated. There's something really off about the Chancellor, and I can't really put my finger on it, I can't explain it, but I could feel it in my gut. Yoda hummed. Do what you must, Captain Rogers. But be on your guard. I always have been, Master Yoda. The silence hung in the air for several moments, until Yoda finally asked. What shall you do now? Now isn't that the million dollar question? Sam lightly said. Stuck in the middle of a galaxy in an all-out war. Is it weird that I don't feel as out of place as I thought? Rhodey asked, raising his hand. Kinda for me I guess. Scott shrugged. 
You guys are the war heroes here. I'm just a dude who could shrink myself and other stuff. Like breaking and entering and doing several Mission Impossible type scenarios with Hank and Hope. Haha, <laughs> do you hear me laughing about it Sam? So funny. Scott deadpanned. What do we do, Cap? Rhodey asked, ignoring the other two bickering right now. Steve gave Rhodey a brief glance before facing Yoda. I'm not so sure about this. Steve said earnestly. I feel bad about throwing ourselves into this, but the more I think about it, the more I know, in my gut, we can't just sit here all cozy in the temple, while well, there's a war raging out there in the stars with our friends possibly being caught in the thick of it. We need to be out there and we need to be out there now. In other words, consider us drafted. Rhodey stated. Yoda sat up straighter now, facing the Avengers with a hardened stare. Sure of this, you all are. Yoda asked, giving each Avenger a look for confirmation. Be sitting around here, twiddling our thumbs all day long. Scott said. I just do what Cap does. Sam remarked. Only a lot slower. Yoda nodded, turning to face Cap once more. Wordlessly, both raised their hands and shook on an unspoken and binding agreement between them both. The Avengers are now officially a part of the Clone Wars. Suddenly, Yoda's communicator went off with several soft beeps. Pulling out his device, he answered. Yes. Master Yoda, we require your presence. Master Plo Koon in Skywalker wishes to speak with the Council. It's quite urgent. The voice of one Obi-Wan Kenobi could be heard coming from the other end. Yoda said that he is on his way, looking back at the Avengers. Join me, will you not? Looking amongst each other, Steve spoke with a small smile. Do you even have to ask?